Hello and welcome to another episode of Chatter, a podcast from The Gist. On today's show we're talking to Dr. Katie Hayward from the Queen's Policy Unit. She's written a lot about the Irish border issue and its role in the Brexit negotiations and some of the more ambiguous things that have been said by the UK government regarding what's going to happen with the border. So I was keen to talk to her because I have had a lot of questions about exactly how the border will be dealt with. If you enjoy the show, you can subscribe to us on iTunes, you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and just generally tell your friends about the show. Today's episode is sponsored by Unison. Unison have just finished fighting the proposed cuts to the Northern Ireland Health Service during a consultation period, and they're constantly fighting privatisation in the NHS and for workers' rights across the health service in general. So if you want to find out more about Unison, you can find some more details in the description. So let's get on with the interview. Do you prefer Dr. Hayward or, or Katie or Katie's Professor? Or... <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't get me in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> is, that, is that a title you can't give yourself then, Professor? No, you can't give yourself a professor. You'd be surprised to hear <laughs> <laughs> Okay, well, Katie, uh, welcome to the show. Thanks for, thanks for agreeing to chat to us about you know, the whole border issue, as, as fun a topic as it is. Mm-hmm. Horror, slightly horrifying at the same time. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, I just wanted to. St- we'll start, shall we, by like laying out what's roughly been said and what we kind of know about what's going to happen and what we don't. So, we know that we're leaving the EU at the moment. That's Article Fifty has been triggered, as you as you mentioned earlier, and we know that there's going to have to be some form of agreement about some form of border, Mm -hmm. either on the island of Ireland, between the north and the south, or around the island of Ireland. And there's been talk about a technological solution that could mean there was a a frictionless border, which seems like the most ridiculous statement ever. Uh, But (laughs) that's that's the, the phrase that's been used, and people have sort of hinted at different technology that could be used, and... Essentially, I don't see where the technology or what technology is out there that could genuinely provide like a viable solution for the situation. To me, it has to be either a border between the Republic and the uh, Northern Ireland, like a hot a border that is going to have to have at least some checks, or a border around the island of Ireland, which is obviously not a very popular, neither are very popular solutions, and. I said, yeah, I just wanted to get your take on, on what's been said and you know, what what the actual viability of some of those options is in the heart. Okay. So you mentioned frictionless border, the idea that um, the Prime Minister stated quite early on um, about having a frictionless and seamless border. She also talked about not wanting to return to the borders of the past and... Uh, all of that language is very welcome. But, of course, we have to bear in mind that the reason why there's a huge reduction in friction across the Irish border in recent times has been because of membership of the Single Market and Customs Union. Um, and I would always urge caution when people are talking about technological solutions to the border and to, to border controls because, um, first and foremost, Technology can't really reduce uh, the fact of the border or the difference that you get between practices and standards on one side of the border and the other. Um, so the reduction in friction is about the the interrelationship and integration, if you like, between either side of the border, both sides of the border. All that technology can do is make it more efficient crossing that border or transporting goods or people across that border um, and um, reducing the experience of risks of delays, for example, or the likelihood of checks. So technology, I've described it as being, you know, if people are trying to talk about technological solutions, they're trying to talk about uh, the light fittings for a house when you haven't even got the planning permission in the first place, you know. And it there's really that's for that point where technology would come in to say, okay, this is what we've agreed, the new relationship between the UK and the EU is like. This is what we've agreed that we want to have. Um 
unchanged or as protected as possible through this new relationship um, and therefore how are we going to do this and in what way can technology help in that um, so the stage we're currently at at the moment is of course not discussing the future uk relationship um, we're still trying to uh, wait to see what the uk government might be willing to allow in flexibility uh, for Northern Ireland after Brexit and the same on the EU side, this idea of flexible and imaginative solutions. So hence our sense of being in a state of limbo uh, or purgatory, depending on how you <laughs> want to put it. Well, that's a slightly more depressing way of thinking about it. But so you, you're talking about the how technology can affect the, the actual difference in standards and, and how big that can be, be dealt with using technology. Um, something that uh, Dennis Campbell that we spoke to, actually uh, the editor of UK Progressive, he was talking about how he felt that there was no way that our standards and practices could change in light of the in light of Brexit because the EU still are probably going to be at least one of our biggest trading partners, if not our biggest, and that in order to maintain access to EU markets that we would have to maintain all the standards in terms of goods and, and services that we were providing. What did, is that is that a sort of a realistic viewpoint or so this is where the uniqueness of Northern Ireland comes in and the potential for reducing friction north and south on the island. So if it was possible to say uh, that Northern Ireland would maintain uh, regulatory equivalence, which is a phrase I heard James Brokenshire using um, a few days ago from the Tory party conference. If you can maintain regulatory equivalence <clears throat> with the single market, uh, this would ease movement of goods, um, possibly even services across the border. That's all well and good, but then the question comes in, well, who would oversee this, who would enforce it? Um, and this is where the question of the... Um, jurisprudence of the ECJ comes in, the European Court of Justice, um, and how could they be reassured that standards in Northern Ireland are maintained um, and um, equivalent to those in the South and the rest of the single market. Um, if you were talking about the UK as a whole, maintaining the standards, um, yes, again, this is where the question of the ECJ comes in because um, the uh, there is a potential there of the UK still remaining in the sing in the single market. So, of course, goods from all around the world have access to the single market. Um, that's not a problem. The question is, um, can you have an agreement that would facilitate that trade? And can the EU be assured about certain the standards of certain goods coming in? Um, and again, that's all doable. Um, it's not necessarily the same as being part of the single market. The single market, of course, entails um, movement of labour, uh, movement of services and capital. It's a much more closely integrated thing. So I wouldn't say that in order to continue to trade with the European Union, you're going to have to maintain their standards. Um, that's, that's not the case. You can certainly trade with them. But as I say, that would have to be framed in a free trade agreement, which I know that the UK wants to have. If it was to want, if it was to want uh, membership of the single market, which it doesn't apparently, but then, <laughs> then uh, uh, obviously that's much more of a close relationship. Uh, that is heading towards frictionless trade at the frictionless border. Mm. Um, um, and then uh, obviously membership of the European free trade area comes in, the possibility of EEA membership and the, the um, uh, rulings from the European, uh, from the EFTA court, you know. Does, does EEA membership include free movement of people? Yes, it does, okay. which is why it's been rejected by the UK government. Yes. Mm -hmm. So, hypothetically, say we, we get along sort of a year, two years, three years, or whatever it is down the line, and we're looking at not getting into the single market, not getting into the, the EA, and they have to impose some form of border. 
No, they've talked about the technology as we sort of touched on there. And I can understand how that can be a, a help for goods and services, but I'm not sure how they can use technology for free movement of people. That seems like it's a lot more difficult to kind of police with a border unless it's a very physical border at the the, well, the border <laughs> or if it's um a border around the whole island of Ireland. Is is there like a an alternative we can have there in that case or Okay, so you're talking about free movement of people. So one thing to be you could be reassured about is the continued existence of the common travel area. Mm. That's pretty much that's pretty much where the most progress has come so far in the talks between the UK and the EU um, uh, uh, around the Irish border or relevant to Northern Ireland. Ireland. Um, and this means that, in principle, you won't have a need for immigration controls between Ireland and Britain. Um, and it also means that, in principle, um, you can have special recognition, if you like, of the status of Irish citizens in the United Kingdom um, who have um, a privileged position compared to um, other EU citizens. Um, same for British citizens in the Republic of Ireland. Um, where the difficulty comes in is distinguishing between British and Irish citizens and other EU citizens on these islands. And um, that is where so-called point of contact controls come in because it's not going to happen. You're not going to have to um, have a visa if you're traveling from, um, um, you know, a, an EU member state into the UK. That, I mean, that doesn't happen for people coming from all sorts of parts of the world coming into the UK. And um, the question is what happens when they seek to access jobs um, um, housing um, and uh, services uh, and that's where those controls would come in and that if you like discrimination would come in um, and that is really unclear because that then of course goes into the the other area that still is to be agreed upon and that is EU citizens rights after Brexit and British citizens rights in, in the EU um, and there seems to be some progress and then some change in what's coming forward about that, about, for example, the need for EU citizens to register when they um, enter with the intention of getting employment in the UK. So it's still very ambiguous at the moment. Mm -hmm. When you talk about how you'd monitor the movement of people, um, it is true that um, good examples of the use of technology to facilitate movement of people across a border are present all around the world. The US Canada is a really good example of this. Mm. Um, you still have to go through a check. Exactly. So th actually, there is there's a hard border and it's a it's a physical border. Mm. So technology comes in because you can have a you have a special pass that enables you to get through without being stopped, you know, um, or without being sort of with reduced risk of being pulled over and, and questioned about mm. where you're going and the purposes of it, etc. So yes, passes can get you across a hard border. Um, if you're trying to not have a border, a physical border at all, um, then that technology is isn't is sort of redundant. Really, it doesn't really have a place. Yeah, just because that's that's the the impression that that I've got that that's what they imagine could happen. That they're going to have this magical force field, and they're just going <laughs> to know whenever someone comes across the border. Yes. <laughs> that that's maybe maybe I'm misinterpreting, but that's the language that they've been suggesting is that. They have this magical way that there will be a border, but no border at the mm. same time. <laughs> yeah. Well, let's bear in mind, I mean, the, the risk with all of this discussion is to imagine the border as a physical line. Mm. Um, whereas in actual fact, the way that we experience borders, border controls, is not, does, is not only at the point of entry or exit. It's actually in our day-to-day -day experience if we go to you know, to a hospital, or if we go to get employment. Um, uh, for example, if somebody in Queens is wanting to get paid for doing some tutorials or a guest lecture or something like this, they have to fill in the form and produce their passport. 
Um, so these kind of controls happen as it is at the moment, and that in effect is some sort of bordering, um, um, as it's termed. And so we are actually quite used to that happening. Um, and it's in those ways, those sort of almost invisible means of discriminating between people or distinguishing between them, if you like, and uh, whether they are legitimately here or, or not, or legally here or not, um, it's, it's those practices that we can definitely expect to increase um, after Brexit. Indeed, those practices of bordering are happening um, at an increasing level around the EU at the moment. Um, and this is clear even not just in airports, but in, in railway stations and bus stations. You know, we're just much more likely to see not just police officers, but border um, border force operators um, checking people's um, ID cards and the like. So that, that whole environment of distinguishing between people is actually um, one that is increasingly present across the Euro European Union as a whole right now. What do you think, do you think the Schengen area will remain for the foreseeable future, just, just on that note? Yes, so in a funny way, it's, it, the, the Schengen zone doesn't really, uh, is, is slightly in doubt at the moment, um, or in question, you can reasonably question it. Certainly, that it's there in principle uh, and in legal terms, but in practice, there's a suspension of it, of its open border, of the open border. So you literally do have physical fences between a number of EU member states at the moment. Yeah, like yes. Oh, well, Hungary is pretty much encircled by a fence. Really? <laughs> yeah. Like a fence pointing in or a fence pointing out? <laughs> Just up, <laughs> quite high up, so people can't climb over it. Um, so yeah, it's to to and. Uh, this uh, across various parts of Europe, but particularly, obviously, in the in the southeast, in response to the so-called migration crisis uh, uh, and refugees coming from uh, war-torn places, um, these fences have gone up, and a lot of criticism. I mean, Hungary is a is a peculiar case, if you if you want to use that term. Uh, because they've been highly critical of the European Union, saying that it hasn't protected its member states against this um, the, this flow of migrants. Mm. But you see consequences of it all the way up into the north as well. Um, and Sweden and Finland and, and more um, increased checks there between in, in the movement of people. Um, so in effect, Schengen is in some ways suspended with an idea that it will be um, reviewed um, soon. Um and it's quite interesting, you know, it's in, it's in response to this perceived external threat. Um, but for our purposes, the key distinction is between Schengen and what's not in Schengen. And the fact that Ireland and the UK are not in Schengen is actually extremely helpful for us at the moment because it enables the continuation of the common, common travel area and the continued uh, in principle practice, um, it, it, the continued principle of not um, having immigration controls between Britain and Ireland. I guess you probably could argue that the EU didn't protect its member states in uh, preventing them from uh, getting involved in the war in, uh, in the Middle East and Northern Africa and um, in some way causing and facilitating the migration crisis <laughs> At the very root, but I, I'm, I get the feeling that's maybe not the argument that Hungary are making. But mm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so with with that um, sort of talked about, do you think that there's a a way in in which, well, actually, before we go into that, what do you think is going to happen with EU citizens within the UK? Do you think the UK is going to eventually just be like, yeah, just anyone who was here before the referendum, that's fine? Or do you think there will be some sort of... Because it feels very key to the agreements at the minute. From what I can tell, yeah. it seems that that has a real sticking point for the EU themselves, and understandably so. Like, that's yes. their citizens, they're representing. But what do you think is going to happen there? Again, the question of ECJ jurisdiction comes in. So that's the key sticking point, whether... Um, 
that can be seen to oversee the rights of EU citizens in, in, um, in the UK. In principle, what it seems at the moment is that, um, according to the position papers in the UK, that um, people will probably need to register um, and there will be new arrangements for those who come in after the end of any transition period. Um, and the mood music, such as it is, would suggest that there will be means by which EU citizens will um, have particular um, privileges when it comes to um, skilled workers, for example, that it won't be a problem for them to, to, to get visas or have the right to, to work. Um, but it, it does mark a con, you know, considerable change in policy um, and practice and of course all those businesses I'm thinking to of course of universities who um, who rely on um, uh, migration from Europe and, and movement of labour and it's important to not just consider the movement of labour as a distinct thing in of itself that people have the right to go and live somewhere else in the EU and take up a job and vote etc um, it's also about the fact that it's so closely connected to, to, to trade and to services. So all these things are closely interlinked. Mm. Um, and that's the whole principle behind the movement of labour, that these things go together um, and that a flourishing economy or economic relationships between um, different countries actually entails the movement of people as well. Mm -hmm. And so putting constraints on that is also putting economic constraints. So... Um, yeah, we don't know. We don't know the details of what's going to be worked out. I mean, if I was a British citizen living in Spain, I I would be deeply concerned too. Mm. Um, <laughs> given the lack of clarity coming from from the UK about what they would like to see um, those citizens um, being reassured uh, by from the EU, or being reassured by from the EU. Um, so yeah, still quite a lot to work out on that one. Yeah. Well, the four freedoms, I think, is something that you've been quite clear on, that they're very much indivisible. Yeah. So that, the, the well, way... Yeah, sorry, just to, just to make me remember, but basically I think that my suspicion is that the UK government didn't intend to leave the single market. Um, when they were first campaigning? Yeah. And you have a number of people on record saying that, that it didn't mean leaving the single Even Daniel Hannan, who's very um, vocal MEP, pro-Brexit MEP, is on record as saying, no, the UK won't be leaving the single market or customs union. Get that ridiculous idea out of your head. Um, and I think they had to change that. They changed, it wasn't even a policy, but they changed their position very rapidly when the EU said, okay, that's all well and good, but you know that being in the single market is includes movement of labour mm -hmm. and then of course if you look at a lot of the studies coming out now about why people voted to leave and the role that the press played in that anti-immigration sentiment was core to it um so that that connection being made between eu membership and immigration uh meant that 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 vote for many was very much an anti-immigration vote and therefore to say, oh, by the way, we leave the EU officially, but we'll stay in the single market and that, oh, yeah, that does mean we'll still have mm. um, um, Polish workers and Lithuanians and Romanians welcome here in the UK. I mean, that just, they thought that that was going to be just a political hard sell. So you think that, well, not even think, so your, your take is that the government didn't, initially intend or the, the 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 part of the government that was campaigning to leave didn't initially intend for free movement of people to be sacrificed as part of the the vote it was more about the political and sort of legal implications that they they were looking to get out of essentially and that the the public's anti-immigration sentiment that has been very much stirred by the press has pushed them towards like a harder Brexit as such than they would have initially gone for, that they're now sort of 
thinking, okay, well, we, we have to now make this about immigration, even mm. though initially it wasn't, because something I find outrageous is that, <laughs> that um, so Theresa May was in, in, the, in the Home Office for six years, saying that she was going to reduce migration to tens of thousands. They took zero steps, like mm. zero. They, they could have implemented the same um, directive that Brussels used to restrict people. I think it's after three months you have to say, you, they basically go, right, you have to have a job or you have to prove you have money. You can't just like stay here indefinitely without either of those things. And we could very easily implemented that and that would have dealt with part of the, the problem that I, I'm not sure really exists, but that people perceive exists, that mm. they could you could have gone, well, it's illegal for them to do that. So no you you haven't really got a point there Mm -hmm. Um, because people have this idea that about three quarters of eastern europe is now living in britain and taking all the benefits (laughs) Mm. um so that could have easily dispelled that myth and potentially cut down maybe not by that many but a few thousand a year and half of our immigration is from outside the eu and they did nothing to curb that like like they could have just if if Immigration was their priority. They could have gone, okay, we're going to cut immigration from outside the EU in half because that's what we have control over. And they didn't do anything about that. So, so your point about the this shift post-vote when they realised what the sentiment was about could very much, I think, I don't, I don't even think immigration really crossed the minds of, of the of the politicians, maybe at the top as, as like the sole reason for leaving I don't know. I I slightly disagree with you there because if you think about what David Cameron went over to negotiate with mm. Brussels about um, before the referendum, and he got those that agreement from Brussels, which was actually a pretty impressive, you know, what he actually managed to come away with. Mm. Now, setting aside the fact that already the UK was pretty lax in enforcing um, what was also already to its hand in terms of um, um, EU citizenship rights and, the, and labour rights from the EU countries in the UK it wasn't really enforcing it to begin with but on top of that it had extra um, qualifications in relation to um, paying for child benefits and that kind of thing. Um, those were never really sold um, during the referendum campaign, it just wasn't what he actually achieved wasn't really put forward um, and uh, they were quite hard won and in an imaginary world where Brexit doesn't happen, <laughs> it would be extremely unlikely for any British Prime Minister to be able to secure such an agreement from the UK uh, from the EU again, mm-hmm. um, because it really was significant concessions, um, as the UK has consistently got actually uh, from the EU. So uh, there's a certain irony there. I do think that I do think that immigration was there. Um, not just from the pro-Brexit front, but I think the UK government definitely pandered to that. But um, do you think that was out of a genuine concern over immigration? Because like, I, the, essentially that's that's my point that I was trying to make um, in my long-winded rant there about um, immigration, in that they, they haven't, they, the, the, there, are, there were options available to them pre-referendum to cut the number of, of migrants coming to Britain, and they just chose not to like a very very concerted just we're not going to do anything we're going to continue to say tens of thousands Mm. and not actually make any progress towards that Mm. well if we think what actions they did take and a lot of them uh, in terms of surveillance for example and you have to think i mean this is going slightly off point but about the way in which um that discourse about immigration is linked to so many other things i mean um terrorism being the obvious one and actually it was quite interesting in Theresa May's Florence speech quite how much she emphasised terrorism as a common, as a shared threat between the EU and the UK and one thing that they can continue to cooperate on in relation to security Uh, she mentioned terrorism frequently and migration frequently um, as a threat, as external threats yeah Um, so I thought that was quite notable um but let's think now. I mean, how how can we how are we in this position? And uh, well, one is this idea of at the heart of it all is this idea of British sovereignty, and uh, you're continually hearing 
uh, government ministers saying this, you know, taking back Nazi national sovereign, we're going to be sovereign country once again. And what do they mean by that when pressed, as far as they are ever pressed on it? And it's in relation to border controls. They think about controlling borders and they're thinking there specifically of migration. Um, and then the second point is that they think, well, we can arrange these trade deals with countries all around the world on our own terms. Um, and this is why immediately then it becomes so difficult for the UK government to say, well, we will be in the, we'll continue in the single market or we'll continue to have a customs union with the EU. Um, and in so doing, and let, let's think about it, this is the very logic of staying out of the single market and, and the customs union, is that you have a friction, frictionful, <laughs> a frictionful border. You know, the, the, you'll have a hard border. That's the whole logic of it. Mm. And then you come to the Irish case and the UK is saying, well, we want a frictionless border there, but we don't want any differentiation within the UK. So whatever happens in Northern Ireland has to be the same as what happens for the rest of Britain. But you're saying, well, but you want hard borders between, you know, the UK and the EU. So that that's why it's such a conundrum and this is why um this is why it's such a knotty issue. Um and this is why we can't we shouldn't be distracted by the focus on technology as enabling a frictionless border. Because the facts are, as the UK government is well aware, you leave the single market, you don't have a customs union, you have friction at the border um and this is why too the eu emphasizing the need for flexible or its capacity for flexible and imaginative solutions around northern ireland um offers us this unique opportunity here for northern ireland in some ways to get the best of both both worlds you know but that <laughs> yeah well, yeah which is what we used to here of course yeah. <laughs> but um but that would require the UK government saying, yeah, something different for Northern Ireland and uh, and something different that has substance, uh, be it um, um, uh, oversight of the ECJ for enabling, you know, um, the maintenance of standards within Northern Ireland that are the same as or equivalent to those in the single market, recognising that that does immediately raise the possibility of increasing distinction, distinction between Britain and Northern Ireland. Yeah, they've, they've been quite sort of adamant there is no distinction to be made, but I, I, I'm not sure where we're going to end up really. It's a bit of a... a I think there are some, I think there are, there's, there's gradients of solution. So at the baseline, uh, you have to have, if you have a no deal, it is a disaster and I'm not trying to over dramatize here, but it really is. Um, because you immediately have the enforcement of WTO rules and tariffs. Um, that's a really hard border, and that would apply to, to all of the UK versus the EU. Um, and that would be before we were able to sign any, any new deals. So yes. we potentially have a, a sort of, well, however long it takes them to negotiate. Yeah. <laughs> they talked about the Japan deal. And and that they were just going to copy and paste EU trade deals with other countries. And I was like, what on earth are you just... Like, what are you smoking in number 10? <laughs> <laughs> just that every every time you seem to think you've got nailed down, like, what they want out of things, they just make these out just crazy statements to, to like, appease someone that seemed to completely go against what, what was what said before. And... Something I wanted to ask was, like, how realistic is 18 months to, to sort all of this out? Because, you know, Good, Good Friday took, well, mine was Sunningdale, and that was the same thing. <laughs> 22 years after Sunningdale? No, wait, Sunningdale 74. 74? Yeah. Okay, so 20, 24 years mm -hmm. it took them to agree on the same thing. Yeah. <laughs> Essentially. Um, like is eighteen months realistic to be able to sort out a border issue that's becoming more and more contentious, especially with the fact that we don't have a government at Stormont mm. who are going to be able to negotiate as a whole and and discuss the issue. Mm. That they're having to also fight out amongst themselves how much money they're going to give to an Irish language act and you know how they're going to put Stormont back together. Like is 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 it just is eighteen months unrealistic? 
Well, the fact is, as Barney said, the clock's ticking, and it wasn't the commission that started the clock ticking, it was Theresa May and her letter. And uh, it's actually, it's going to be have to be, we've really got about a year now, because um, an agreement has to be uh, drawn up by October next year in order for it to go through and get approval from uh, the European Parliament and that takes a long time. Um, so for everything to be all the everything to be in place in time for the UK to withdraw cleanly as this is new term, the clean Brexit, um, it all has to be done by October, agreed by October in order to be signed off by for, for in time for March. Um, no, that's not going to happen. No. Um, it really, it, two years in and of itself would have already, would have, um, already been a difficulty. Um, and there's been such a lack of clarity about the UK's position. Um, and as you say, people contradicting each other, um, that it's, it is, it's not going to be doable. Now, the issue of a transition phase is a very pertinent one. In some ways, it does give us a bit of a lifeline. It should have been requested right at the beginning, um, alongside the trigger of Article 50 saying, this is what our first demands are, or requests are, or negotiating stances, that we want a transition phase, because it has to be approved by the other member states. Um, and of course, um, if you're not considering the domestic, uh, well, sorry, if you are considering the needs of the uh, domestic market and country, but you're not considering necessarily the discourses from particular papers or parts of um, political parties um, you'd say the longer the better um, unfortunately we're, we're not at that point and it is clear that the tr transition phase that could be negotiated it would have to be one where you're clear about what you're going to and you have to sort of have that agreed before the transition phase can happen because it's a transition to something. Mm -hmm. It's not uh, an indecision phase. Or oh, let's just try and you know work things out a little bit more detail phase. No, it's you, you work things out and then you say, we're going to need this amount of time to implement it. Um, and uh, those those phases are necessary because because of the incredible amount of change um, that this will require from across the private sector uh, and public sector um, uh, and the and the details and, and the resources and the training and the infrastructure um, and the IT <laughs> systems. Oh, it's just enormous. Um, so, uh, yeah, 18 months. I can't see it happening. If you could spend 18 months solely on trying to figure out how to get the case law into UK law. Like you could you could spend eighteen months with a whole team just on that and not be finished. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like having having looked at enough of it in my time at yes. Queen's here. Yes. Uh I know how outrageously complex and numerous different bodies and institutions that you have to figure out where we stand on and it mm. Well, if you think, I mean, the EU withdrawal bill is a really significant um, potential piece of legislation there. And the rationale behind that, in theory, is, well, we'll just transpose it all across into UK. But, of course, they do want to have distinction. They'll definitely need distinction or divergence if they're going to have those uh, trade deals with the US and New Zealand and Japan or wherever. Um, and... Um, that's where the difficulty comes in, um, because how how, does, how is that scrutinised? And there are major concerns about the capacity of ministers to to make those decisions, which essentially means officials, right? Mm. Um, whose activities are not transparent, um, and ministerial powers being enhanced in that regard that they can decide maybe what changes are made. And there's particular worry, as we know, from the devolved regions and nations about that. Yeah, it does It does raise a lot of questions. Like, I don't know if I'm unique or in a minority or, you know, this is everybody. I, I don't think it's everyone, but 
my biggest fear about the vote like pre-referendum was that I didn't trust the Conservatives to uphold a lot of the the regulations and standards that have been put in place on like environmental work, on workers' rights, on consumer rights, on on so many different issues. Like even even if you just talk in environmental rights, like the air air quality, water quality, cleanliness of like beaches, uh, protected parts of of Britain in terms of you can't build here, you can't you know you've got to be careful about how, what materials you use. Just like so many things that have become not ingrained, but that have, have become quite necessary. I feel like I, I think people would maybe be shocked to see the photos of British beaches in the 70s before the, those regulations were, were put in place or at least implemented in the UK. And I think that the EU withdrawal bill in its current form kind of realises every single one of those fears and that it, that they, that the ministers are, tell me if I'm being too dramatic, but they're just being given unilateral power to change whatever they fancy within their specific uh, region of uh, uh, competence isn't the word, but mm -hmm. <laughs> um, within their sp specific uh, departments. Yeah. yeah. I don't, do you think those fears are kind of justified? Do you think it's, I'm being a bit dramatic on, you know, how, how much they could be abused or potentially will be abused or... Well, this is why the EU is insisting um, for, for citizens' rights and for if the if they want to have um, a frictionless border in certain ways that the the, that the European Court of Justice would have, have a position so that you're not you're not completely dependent on on national governments or national courts for this that there's an overriding authority there and I don't I do think that there's a deep concern for devolution and and the Welsh and Scottish ministers, ministers have expressed that very well um, because essentially this is a centralization of powers to an enormous degree and combining that with a potential lack of transparency um, now you can understand. I can completely actually understand the logic for it, the rationale for it, anyway, because of the complexity of it all and the enormity of the task ahead. Um, to have to get through, go through the normal processes by which legislation is changed would be hugely onerous and time-consuming. But at what cost? You know, at what cost um, is it that we would allow those? Um, uh, decisions to be made that would have such implications for us you know, um, as citizens and as consumers. It'd be interesting. I know I know quite a few of the, there was a, lot, a couple of Labour MPs got a lot of uh, backlash for voting for the bill in its, in its second, second reading there that they just passed it. Or was it passed into the second reading? Or I think it's good. I think it was just the first reading, wasn't it? The first reading? Yeah. Okay, yeah, isn't it? I don't know. So, yeah, so that a lot of a lot of Labour MPs got a lot of backlash for, for voting for it. You have a, even though they voted for the amendment to, to reduce those those, part, those powers without, that haven't really got any sort of bounds on them, the, the Henry VIII mm. powers, um, as they're being called. But I feel like and I don't know what your take on this is actually. I don't I don't know where all these people who are expecting Jeremy Corbyn to say, No, we're not gonna we're not gonna go ahead with Brexit if if I just I just think they're being utterly delusional like them. <laughs> he's he's never been a big fan of Europe. Neither the is opposite. quite yeah, yeah, and neither is quite a lot of the, the, the left in, yeah. in Labour. Dennis Skinner um was people were shocked that he voted for the withdrawal bill, even though he's I think voted against every single piece of, of <laughs> European integration in his time in Parliament that has yeah. come up. And he's been a vocal opponent of, of the EU and he his constituency but with like 70% to leave. Mm. And, and, and yet all these people seem to think that Jeremy Corbyn's just going to turn around so, like at some point and then like, like Nick Clegg, Nick Clegg said like yesterday, he was like, vote Labour if you want to stop Brexit. And I was like, what are you talking about, man? <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah. Actually, the position of Nick Clegg was interesting because he because he lost his seat, <laughs> and he was one of the most vocal MPs and I have to say well informed MPs on the EU, and uh, in the run up to the election, and then he was he was ousted, so you couldn't sort of say, you know, you can't assume that there's be a strong way clear sort of wave of Remain voters who persuade Labour to go a particular direction. Yeah, like I, not that we can vote for any of the major parties, which I find ridiculous, which would be, it could be much more satisfaction to vote Labour here. Um, or well, that's a whole other debate, or, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. I just have to end up voting Green <laughs> on here. Cause, but um, it's, it's a really strange issue. I just, I feel like they've just got their hopes up for nothing. That someone's convinced them that that Jeremy Corbyn's gonna make everything all right. <laughs> and it just seems like a very naive position to think he's gonna. He's opposed to to Brexit because he can't implement a lot of what he would ultimately envision as what Britain needs within the EU because of, of restrictions. And but they're never gonna say like a. Their current front bench is, is I think, fully behind it. They've, they've shown that in their willingness to use the, the three-line whip in order to get everyone to in line, and it's not always worked. There's been some people resisting, and that's probably going to happen on such a huge issue. Mm. But I just, I'm baffled by the, uh, the, the whole idea <laughs> that he's going to stop things. Um, is, there, is there any EU precedent for the border issue that we have going on is there any sort of that well that you know of is there any in any countries that are sort of eu members asterisk and like any of the, the associate membership yeah so, well, israel for, israel would be one for certain programs in relation to research there are lots of examples of so-called differentiated treatment of um of micro states and yeah. parts of member states associated um, um countries of member states so the overseas territories for example so it was really interesting precedent for um a new sort of different treatment of these of these places um most of that though in fact all of it all of those arrangements depend on the main member state oh sorry the main state being a member state of the eu so that's the starting point so f for example um in greenland and the faroe islands um they're not members of the eu um but you can have citizenship they can still be full eu citizens of the eu and enjoy room to labor etc but that's because Denmark um, is still a member of the EU. So they let, well, sorry, the Greenland left the EU, but Denmark remains a part of the EU. And so through that, through the Danish connection, they have EU citizenship rights. So, um, and there's just other, so even within the UK or um, associated countries of the UK, um, such as um, obviously Jersey and Guernsey and the Isle of Man, not full EU members, but enjoy some privileges of EU membership. Um, not necessarily in terms of citizenship, but in terms of uh, um, customs union membership, for example, single market membership. So there's lots of different hodgepodge arrangements that you could look to. Mm -hmm. The difficulty for Northern Ireland is, of course, if the UK withdraws, it, it sort of takes away that fundamental connection, which is necessary um, to follow on from those examples um, now again then you think well what about what is distinctive about Northern Ireland not just the peace process but but the particular position of Ireland in relation to Northern Ireland mm -hmm. as has been established in the Good Friday Agreement and in fact long before that um, and the Irish Agreement framework documents and the like so um, is there some way there by which Northern Ireland can have enjoy a particular position vis vis the EU um, and citizenship comes to the fore there so both the UK government and the EU have said um, Irish citizens in Northern Ireland will continue to enjoy full rights as EU citizens 
and some ways this has gone even further they've sort of talked you know in all its fullness the rights of EU citizenship in all its fullness which one presume means right of movement yeah um it's it's not been clarified by any means yet um but then then you have this question of well that implies a profound inequality between Irish citizens and British citizens in Northern Ireland, um, which contradicts or contravenes the Good Friday Agreement in a certain way. And would there be a possibility of British citizens or people who choose not to take up Irish citizenship, but they have a birthright to it, without British citizens having those rights too? Um, and let's bear in mind, this isn't just... Uh, the right, you know, sort of a, a privilege of people who are, are able to to travel or choose to work abroad. You know, it's not a sort of middle class benefit. These are fundamental rights, and such rights are so important. And we recognise that in Northern Ireland as well. Um, and um, would this be would this be something that could be there for a foundation for sort of saying, yeah, Northern Ireland is a distinctive and unusual place, and may or may not necessarily then relate to particular arrangements in relation to trade. I would think, I would hold out hope that there might be, uh, in such a spirit, there might be such arrangements for North and South relationship to an East and West. The implementation bodies could be set up in the realms of health, in the realms of environmental protection, social security, um, that could help facilitate um, a frictionless border in certain ways, um, or certainly enable Northern Ireland and the border region to benefit from what it is to have a comparatively open border and good integration in certain sectors um, for the benefit of of the of, of both. That would be my hope. <laughs> Well, we could keep our fingers crossed. Yes, yeah. I'd certainly say, though, that the, the, the way that the UK government has approached this, and also perhaps the EU as well, maybe it doesn't have the scope to think about it more imaginatively, but it's been very much about seeing the Good Friday Agreement as a sort of a set text or a, an agreement about, or like an accord. But actually, it's so much more than that. And at its heart... What do you mean by that? Well, at its heart, it's saying that Northern Ireland is a unique nexus for, for Britishness and Irishness. Um, and that's been allowed to flourish, if you like, and I don't think that's a bad thing, in the context of European integration. Um, and therefore, those multi-layered dimensions of the British-Irish relationship in Northern Ireland, across the island, between these islands, that can still be protected in some ways. Um, and I think the concentration or the focus on trade and the customs border um, is missing the bigger picture completely and utterly um, by thinking, well, what's core to the core to the piece here? And it's about proper recognition of, um, of, the, of the Irish dimension here. Um, in a way that isn't seen to be threatening or diminishing to the to the Britishness of Northern Ireland citizens in Northern Ireland, um, and it's just it's probably unsurprising, but it is concerning that that they retreat to a particular version of British sovereignty and nationalism has made it seem that thinking about an all island connection of some sorts after Brexit would be a derogation of the close relationship or the, in, the integral part that Northern Ireland plays in the UK. Those two That doesn't need to be a zero-sum calculation, that's what the agreement showed and yet that's right where we're at now. And again, to just repeat the point that um, the focus on technological solutions for a frictionless border is a is a is a real distraction to the to the fundamentals here, and I suspect that that's what the EU is waiting for the UK government to to officially explicitly recognise. You know, the Northern Ireland is distinctive in its own way, and that's not that's a 
strength and it was a huge achievement in the 1998 agreement to actually explicitly recognize that and institutionally and formally recognize that. Do you think that the, the vote they took, that they said Northern Ireland would be allowed to remain within the single market? Or the European the, Parliament? Yeah, the European Parliament. Do you think that is in any way like a little nudge? Um, I think I think it ups the ante a little bit. I think it's sort of saying, let's put this on the table. Certainly some people in Northern Ireland are certainly saying that, and not just political parties. There are huge consequences um, for the relationship then between Northern Ireland and GB. Um, so it is the case that if you have Northern Ireland in the single market and customs union, there is then a customs barrier of sorts between Northern Ireland and GB. I, I still think that there are ways of managing that. Um, and as I say, sorry, I'd never sort of completed my uh, explanation of different solutions. But first and foremost, you need to have a free trade agreement between the UK and the EU. It could be deep and comprehensive. It could include services even. Um, and if you have that as a baseline, then you can think about what would be best suit the interests of Northern Ireland or protect the economy of Northern Ireland apart from anything else. And does membership of the customs or does a customs union arrangement with the EU make sense? Does participation in the single market of sorts or some some sort of um, uh, mirroring of that? I mean, that would be extremely difficult to get agreement on in the EU, but could, some, could that happen if Northern Ireland sort of mimics that um, in a way that's acceptable to the EU? Um, but the more... It is the case that the closer integration you have between sorry, the less differentiation you have between Northern Ireland and the EU, um, the more the risk of differentiation between Northern Ireland and GB, if it is the case that the UK wishes to diverge greatly from the EU. But if the UK says, okay, we want to do X and Y, but fundamentally we agree that we want to maintain uh, parity or similarity in these ways, then that's a really good baseline for thinking about what might be possible to reduce friction north, south and east, west. Okay, well, one, one last question then. What do you, what do you think you know, will be the, the final outcome? Or the <laughs> well, I hate to be uh, depressing, <laughs> <laughs> but it's increasing I'm increasingly concerned that no that a no deal scenario is a likely scenario. And I think that because um because what British government ministers are saying and quite confident in saying such as uh let's prepare for a no deal scenario. <laughs> Um, and it, <laughs> well, at least they're prepared. They're well, more prepared for that than they were for the referendum to go the way. That's it true. Was. That's true. I mean, I think. I mean, in one in one way, that's talk. That's just bluff. But on another, they're saying much more about that than they're saying about what they want the relationship between the UK and EU to be in in a substantive, realistic way. Um, and I saw. Uh, an awful statistic the other day from a future England survey it was conducted by Cardiff and Edinburgh universities of English voters and um, people who voted leave who supported the Tory party almost nine in ten of those said they wanted to secure Brexit even if it means jeopardising the Northern Ireland peace process and it was almost seven in ten Labour supporting Leave voters said exactly the same thing. Yeah, yeah, it's harsh. So then you think, well, if I, you know, if if you're in London and you're work, trying to work out, you're trying to get out of the Brexit mess. Um, I think everybody agreed there's a bit of a mess at the moment. Um, then in your list of priorities, um, saving face with those voters or trying to, um, trying to manage the the very immediate um, pressures um, 
from um, the Brexit lobby, um, that may you know, that may become an increasing priority over thinking about the enormous complexity and the head wrecking nature of the Irish border and trying to find solutions here, especially ones. I mean, you mentioned yourself about how long the Good Friday Agreement took, especially agreements here that would entail clear compromise on all sides who entail great nuance and sensitivity. And we don't seem to have an environment in which that is really being fostered or can be allowed to be nurtured. <laughs> and the sort of things we don't have. Yes. <laughs> uh, we don't have time, we don't have resources. I mean, this is not to say uh, those who are, who, are, who are tasked with dealing with the Irish situation in, 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 um, in Whitehall around various issues connected to Brexit. That's not to say they're not incredibly sincere and incredibly hardworking. I know that they are. Um, but if it's going to be decided politically and not technically, um, then we need to see a big change in approach. Um, and at the very highest levels, we need proper recognition from the British government about the importance of the Irish government. And that's not a political statement. That's based on the Good Friday Agreement. Um, so those basics need to come back to the fore if we're going to have uh, an agreement or an outcome from Brexit that will not cause harm to Northern Ireland. Well, we have at least some hope in that Ireland fosters on reasonably good terms, That's amazingly. Not sure how it would um, Leo Varad Carr. Mm, long may it last. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm not sure how or why or any mm. of them, but any of the... Uh, the reasons behind, but they seem to get on well, and uh, I think that that can only be a good thing. <laughs> great, great, yeah, yeah. So, but anyway, thanks very much for uh, for having the chat. Um, I totally enjoyed it. Yeah, it was, uh, it was you're not the most neutral myself. interview <laughs> I've ever encountered. <laughs> <laughs> well, you have a position on these things, I take it. Well, yeah, Josh, but yeah. I, I like to think that. I'm more than willing to change anything that I feel or, or believe in and listen to anyone that wants to tell me that I've misinterpreted something or or I'm not uh, analysing something correctly or I've got my facts wrong, like straight flat out. But I feel like fairly confident in my own interpretation of, of what's going on. And, you know, I'm very open to being challenged on, on absolutely anything. But I'd expect I, nothing less of a good graduate of Queen's. <laughs> <laughs> it's great. Yeah. Um, but you know, I like to. Uh, I feel that if you don't have a, if you don't have your own interpretation of something, you can't really have thought about it. Mm. Like anyone that's really looked at an issue is going to have a, at least an inkling as to what they think the interpretation of certain things are. Mm -hmm. And I like to think I don't misrepresent what I'm talking about when I'm, you know, putting my own opinion on things. No, but... no. <laughs> That's great. Thanks very much for listening. If you enjoyed the show, don't forget you can subscribe to us on iTunes or Stitcher or wherever you get your podcasts. And you can like and subscribe to our feed on Facebook, on YouTube, or even subscribe to our mailing list if you want to keep up with what we're doing. Until next time, thanks for listening.